what you do in our hearts in adversity. We praise you for your goal and your purpose in the lives of every sinner that you've saved in here, Lord. I pray tonight you would encourage us, empower us, motivate us, Lord, to do more for your name's sake, to step outside of ourselves and our own desires, to reach for your desires, to want to be like Christ tonight. Would you make us more like your son tonight as we talk about him? Thank you for being so good. In your name I ask, amen. All right, get your Bibles out if you would. Matthew chapter 1. We, it's been a few weeks, thanks to that pesky little quarantine, but uh, glad to keep you all safe. That. Glad to keep you all safe. I did actually have um, uh, COVID for, I don't know, a couple days, something that really was kind of just like a bad sinus headache. Um, thank the Lord that it was not anything extreme, and we want to continue to pray for those who do get extreme cases of it. And I believe that's going to continue for a while. You know, it's mutating and doing everything else. And, you know, what we want to do is just make sure it doesn't take our focus off the Lord. Amen. And, and what's truly important in this life, no matter what the sickness is. Matthew chapter 1, you know, we're going through a series on Sunday mornings called No Ordinary Man. And uh, I didn't get to preach this morning. And it's been a while. I wanted to jump back into this with you in this series. So as we go step by step through the Gospels, talking about our Lord and the life of our Lord we're just barely past his birth right now in the series, and we're in Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, and, and this is just in, in a way of a little bit of review. And uh, yeah, actually, you can go ahead and put, uh, can I, our, our topic really is on the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus, and I wasn't planning on doing this. I wanted to get through a big chunk of verses and really continue on with our study, but uh, as the verse we're going to read in a minute I wanted to um, get a little deeper into the name of Jesus, to the name of Jesus. We'll say more about that in a minute. And uh, great to see everybody here. Steve, good to see you, my man. Good to see you. All right. Glad everyone's here tonight. And the Bentons as well. And everybody else. <laughs> I guess I feel Brother Mike's pain. Don't start naming names. Then you're going to miss somebody. <laughs> All right. So, Matthew chapter 1 and verse 18, I would like to, in way of review, do point number one, which is God chose the parents that would protect that name. And we're talking about the name of Jesus. God was very intentional in who he chose to come in, to bring into this world his son, Jesus Christ. And as in a way of review and context, let's go ahead and read Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. In other words, this is how it happened. When as his mother Mary was espoused, engaged to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the, prophet, of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, as Isaiah 7, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Just in a way of context here for point number one, Mary, a virgin, was with child. She was pregnant, and she had to tell her fiancé that she was pregnant. Very awkward moment for her, no doubt. Joseph was her fiancé, her spouse, and while Joseph pondered on this news, probably a little anxious, I would imagine, pondered on what he was to do about this, and we're not going to go into the whole Hebrew process of espousal. We did that before. You can catch uh, a few weeks before quarantine. He, he was uh, told in a dream that night by Gabriel, the angel of the Lord came, we believe it was Gabriel, same, same one that gave the announcement before, came and said, do not divorce. He didn't use those words, but that what was going to happen. 
if your fiance cheated on you, the only way to take care of that was to break it off. But that would put her to a public shame, and Joseph was a good man. He didn't want to do that. He didn't want to do that. The angel of the Lord comes and delivers a message in a dream and says, don't, don't put her away. It's okay. Go ahead and marry, marry, <laughs> marry, marry, <laughs> because the baby she's carrying is divine. The baby she's carrying is from God. He would be a boy. He was put there by God to save his people from their sins. And he put Joseph at ease. He came to him in a dream. That was important. We talked about that a few weeks ago. Joseph, the Bible says, immediately married his wife. Immediately. And you can imagine why. I think of all, this, all the um, skepticism and the scandal that would go with that. You've been married five months, and your baby was just... Okay. Yeah, that, that wouldn't have gone well. He marries her immediately, saving her from ridicule, and oddly enough, continues celibate for the first nine months of their marriage. It was no mistake that God chose Joseph and Mary to carry his son. No mistake at all. I don't know, I'm not going to go into detail in a mixed audience, but uh, those of us who have been married, to not actually be married for nine months when you're married, anyways, that was a challenge, I'm sure. But Joseph did that. He was a good man, and he knew what God had said and what needed to be done. It was no coincidence God chose this man and this woman. Uh, even though, you know, we see this over and over again, that Joseph and Mary did not understand the things that were going on. As many times as an angel came or, or a prophet came and shared what God had said about Jesus, the whole time Jesus was growing up and even into his earthly ministry, we see this over and over again. Mary pondered these things in his heart. His parents were amazed or marveled at what was said. The whole time they didn't get it. But that didn't stop them from being obedient to the Lord. It didn't stop them. And, you know, I see that over and over in the scriptures, that people that God puts in the scriptures for us to be encouraged by, to be exhorted by, they didn't always understand what was going on. You know, I, 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 I find it a little, um, I don't know if audacious is the word, but a little uh, arrogant of our current generation that's growing up, where they seem to think that they have the right to question everything that God said as if somehow we're going to catch God in a mistake. And that Christianity really has the responsibility to prove to them that God is real. We have to prove that. That's not what Mary and Joseph did. And by the way, I don't think God would have sent his son to somebody like that. He sent it to a man and a woman that were pure, that loved the Lord, that were going to be obedient to the Lord, and they proved this over and over again. And right here at the beginning is where we see the proving you know, as I was thinking of this, I, I wondered, why did God, and I don't know God's mind on this, why did God choose them? And I don't know exactly why it is, but one thing keeps coming to my mind. God chose them because he could trust them. And I, I thought about my own life. Could God trust me with something like this? Could, do, could God give me something that was so precious and yeah, God could have taken over and made Joseph and Mary do exactly what he wanted, but God doesn't do that. God, God does that with evil people. But that's not his will for his children. He wants his children to choose willingly to obey and serve him for his glory, because that's what brings him glory. He could trust Mary and Joseph, and I wonder myself, I wonder for you and all of us, can God trust us with something like that? You say, well, of course he could. Well, the proof is in, are we trustworthy in the little things? Because we don't be, become trustworthy overnight, right? We prove ourselves. We become faithful in the little things, and then God makes us faithful over that which is much. That's the scriptural principle. Can God trust me? And we step into our timeline tonight. Jesus, the Savior of the world, has now been born, and it was a glorious day. Point number two, God chose his name. God chose his name. This wasn't something that was just come up by the family, although that was a regular occurrence in Bible times and in humanity in general, right? I have five children. I named, well, not I, but we named every single one of them after, I'm not going to say much dispute. That might be an exaggeration, but small disputes. Right? My wife wanted a long, beautiful name for all of our girls. Not Jason. No beautiful name. She did actually want a beautiful name for him, and ah, I cut that one right out. That was not working. And uh, I went with Jason. 
Is that you talking about me? Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. All right, I got the tongue on that one. Nice. We'll talk about that one after church. <laughs> But she wanted the beautiful names, and I said, okay, I'm okay with a beautiful name as long as I can have a nickname. And uh, the kids in youth group know I like nicknames, so I give everybody a nickname, including my own daughters. So we, we did that, and thankful for it. God chose Jesus' name. Let's go to Luke chapter 2. That's currently where we are in the timeline, Luke chapter 2, verse 21. And as we're doing this study, we'll be going throughout all four of the Gospels, whatever um, they, are, they do kind of go um, chronologically together, but they deal with different aspects of it. Matter of fact, my daughter and son-in-law have given me, they have two of these, and it's a great book, and I highly recommend it by Edward Barclay, My Lord and My God. It's a, it's a chronological, um, I'm losing the word, it's a chronology of all four Gospels at the same time. So as it's happening, it, it has all the passages. It has maps. It has all sorts of different notes. It's called My Lord and My God. Look it up. It's well worth your money. Uh, it's been excellent in this study. Thank you for that. Uh, God chose his name. Luke chapter 2, verse 21. And when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. God told him way ahead of time, that his name was to be Jesus, and Mary and Joseph did exactly that. I wonder what would happen if they would have named him something else. That's not even something we have to think about, because he could trust him to do exactly what he said. God told him what to do, and they did it. You know, as we're going tonight, this is actually going to be a little more teaching tonight than preaching, but there'll be plenty of application. As we're going through the choosing um, of the name of Jesus, don't know exactly why God did that, but I know that over and over again we see that Mary and Joseph were exactly the right people to bring Jesus into this world. We see in Luke chapter 2, verse 21, that they're on their way to Jerusalem. They waited eight days. The child was to be circumcised. Not going to spend a lot of time on this, but circumcision is all through the Bible. All through. I mean, it permeates the Bible. Why? What is circumcision? Circumcision, it was a covenant. Let's go ahead and turn to Genesis chapter 17 while I'm talking here. Genesis 17, 9. It was a covenant or a promise, a decision that God made with Abraham, and it involves circumcision as a symbol. Symbol? <laughs> yeah, right. A symbol. <laughs> that's, a, that's a new one there. A symbol of this pact or this decision that God made with man and all of these future descendants of Abraham. Okay, this great nation he was going to make of Abraham. Circumcision was the symbol. I mean, it really the symbol of unmerited favor of God. I mean, why did God choose Abraham? Um, because he did. Abraham, again, was a righteous man, but was he the only righteous man on the planet? God chose Abraham. That's his business. God chooses who he, who he chooses to choose. In Genesis chapter 17, verse 9, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant, therefore thou and thy seed, thy children, after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which he shall keep between me and you and thy children after thee. Every man child among you shall be circumcised, and you shall circumcise the flesh of your foreskin, and it shall be token, a token of the covenant betwixt or between me and you. And he that is eight days old, catch this, eight days old shall be circumcised among you. Every man child in your generations, he that is born in the house or bought with money of any stranger, which is not of thy seed or of thy children. This was a Hebrew custom back from the days of Abraham, Genesis chapter 17, and it was to be uh, observed forever. And in Jewish circles, it's still observed today, even. It's still observed today for every man-child. This happens. It was a symbol of God's covenant with Abraham. Why did God choose this procedure? To symbolize his promise to Israel? I don't know. I don't know. Maybe some of you have an idea. Um, but I know this. It's all through the scriptures. God refers to it all the time because he's symbolizing his un unmerited favor, his grace given to mankind. God all the time is symbolizing things, giving us ways to remember what he did. And they, they might even know more in the Hebrew culture of the importance of this. But, you know, I was, I was thinking about this. Do we understand that it's okay for us to obey God and do things that God tells us to do, even if maybe we don't understand why it's like that? Or why we're even supposed to do that? We see Mary and Joseph exhibiting why God chose them. Here they are, eight days, and they had to travel a great distance to get this done, to make sure they were staying uh, with the Abrahamic covenant. 
given a few thousand years before. It was a long time ago. But Mary and Joseph were going to do what was right. God chose his name. He was important. They're going to take care of it. He was the man child. And here they go. Here they go. So, eight days. Eight days this has happened. On the eighth day, the rabbi would come, perform his duties on the child, and then his name would be announced. And his name was announced. But it wasn't Joseph, it was Jesus. It was Jesus. You know, as, as I was thinking about this, and maybe y'all never think about stuff like this, I don't know, but I was thinking, you know, why Jesus? What to, y'all, y'all ever think about how many, um, in Christianity, how many times the name of Jesus, I'm not saying how many times Jesus is said, but there's, there's songs about the name of Jesus, there's books about the name of Jesus, there's poems, there's entire messages, like tonight, about the name of Jesus. I mean, what is so important about the name of Jesus? I mean, I went, I went to high school with a guy named Jesus. He was Spanish. It was Jesus. And he was pretty vile. I mean, it wasn't anything special. But nothing, definitely nothing worth singing about, about this guy. So what's so different about a man born 20, over 2,000 years ago? I don't know where the 20 came from. 2,000 years ago, and we just rave about his name. I mean, they'll write song after song after song after song. Um, about the name of Jesus. But why? Well, I wanted to know why. I ask that a lot. I ask why. Uh, maybe it's my generation. I don't know. But I, if I can know why, I want to know why. And I can't always. But I did a study on names, Hebrew names. And we're going to kind of look at that tonight. Did a study on the purpose of names. Now, in American culture, we, we do like name meanings. Some of us probably more of a motherly thing. Maybe they're, they're looking at names for their kids. And, oh, this is a cute meaning. And maybe when... Uh, I mean, I never did this as a guy, but maybe there's guys out there like it name meanings. That's fine, okay, if you want to do that. But I know my daughters like that. They like doing that stuff. They want to, you know, they're the ones that would get like a name book and look through it and say, oh, that's so cute. Oh, that's so cool. It's name yeah, Okay. So, but what's, it's not as big of a deal, I don't think, in American culture. In ancient times, it was a big deal. It was a big deal. Our priority now in picking names, I find it seems like, is how cool the name sounds or how beautiful it is, not, not so much as what it means. It was the opposite in Hebrew culture. It was the opposite. Hebrew names had rich meaning. And as, as you're looking through Hebrew names in the scriptures, many times you're getting an insight into that person by the name. Matter of fact, I marvel at that sometimes. It's like, how did they know? How did they know what that person was going to... But as I studied it, there's actually some divisions there. There's some divisions there. They had rich meaning, so much so that even, um, you know, when we read in Matthew 18 how Jesus says that not um, one jot or one tittle will fail to pass from the law. Everything, Hebrew, Hebrew names were that important that even if you changed a punctuation mark, it changed the meaning. Even if you changed one little letter or one little stroke on the letter, it changed the meaning somehow. Meaning was a big deal in the Hebrew language. No... Um, no wonder God used that to pen the Old Testament and a little bit of Aramaic. I don't know anything about that language. But Hebrew language is very rich, very rich. They knew the reason Jesus said that every jot and tittle in the Old Testament prophecies would come true, even the punctuation, had the potential to change the meanings. If you'd been born in, in ancient times, your name probably would have had a meaning and a purpose behind it. Um, you know, I've, I've looked at, uh, th- there we go, study of purpose of Hebrew names. There's a few different purposes I found. Your name could have, have, uh, could have been describing the purpose for your birth. In other words, you were born to save your people, like, like it said about Jesus, or you were born to deliver your people from judgment, or, you know, etc. Uh, there's this, another one there. It could have been the result of a parent's reaction at your actual birth. They could have named you that. It could have been, um, just don't change the slide yet, it could have been a reaction to something that was happening at the time. I mean, who would have wanted to have been that child that was named Ichabod? The glory has departed. Poor kid. I mean, that wasn't his fault, you know? But that's the way it had. There's rich meaning, rich meaning. Number three, sometimes the name established the tie to the family. We saw that uh, with John the Baptist being born, right? They wondered why he didn't name uh, his son after the father. Well, that's because God told him to name him John. But they were fully expecting it to be named Zacharias. Uh, number four, it, sometimes it communicated a message to others. Sometimes the life of that person 
the name of that person was communicating a message to those that were around in their family or in their nation. And I was wondering, what, what could it mean? So if that's what human beings naming other human beings was, what could it mean if God named you? I mean, you think about this. Human beings have limited knowledge on what's going to happen in somebody's life, right? I mean, we can only look forward so far, and really we're guessing if we look forward too far past like 30 seconds, right? But not God. Not our omniscient, eternal God who superimposes over everything in eternity, sees the end from the beginning, Isaiah tells us in Isaiah, 40, uh, Isaiah 16, 10, knows the end from the beginning. He would have perfect insight into the future, perfect insight into the purpose of somebody's birth, perfect insight in, into what that person could accomplish for his cause or for somebody else's cause. Which, interestingly enough, this is a good study. Here are some of the people that God named. Some of the people that God named, interestingly enough, starts off with the first man that ever lived. Adam. Adam means earthy or red earth. Why is that uh, significant? Well, let's turn to Genesis chapter 2. So here starts the Bible study. We're going to be turning to a bunch of different scriptures. Genesis chapter 2. We're looking at the importance of a name. And we're going somewhere with this. Don't get lost. Genesis chapter 2. And I do have these in biblical order here. So Genesis chapter 2, we see Adam in verse number 7. It says, And the Lord God for man of the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. That man was Adam. It said the Lord God formed of the dust of the ground. A little mystery that Adam's name meant earthy. It was where he came from, the very first man. You say, how do you know God named him? Nobody else was around. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, to me, that's pretty self-explanatory there. God named him earthy. It was on purpose. It's where he came from. Genesis 17, 5. Let's look at the next one. Abraham. Abraham means the father of many, but that wasn't always his name. That was the name that God gave him. God gave him that name. Genesis 17, 5. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram. Abram means high father. He was a patriarch of that family. He said, it won't be called that anymore, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. I've done something in your life, Abraham. I'm going to change your name to signify that. His wife, similar. Let's go to uh, verse 15, same chapter, verse 15. Sarah. Sarah means lady or princess or noble woman. Noble woman. But that wasn't always her name, right? In Genesis 17, 15, And God said unto Abraham, As for Sarai, thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her, and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she will be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. No longer was she going to be just a normal mother. God was exalting her. He made his covenant promise with her husband Abraham. And obviously, he wasn't going to bear the children. She was going to. And he changes her name from Sarai, which just meant my princess. Might have been given her from her father, who loved her very much. Now, the name given her by God was lady, princess, noblewoman. She's going to be the queen, in other words, of the nation that I'm going to bring forth. And what was that nation? It was God's chosen people. God had a purpose, and he named according to that purpose. Let's keep going. We got another one. Jacob. I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself. Israel. <laughs> Slide says Israel. There we go. Israel in Genesis 32. Turn there if you would. You know the story. Jacob is wrestling with the angel of the Lord. We find out later on that it was God. It was a Christophany. Okay. He's wrestling with the angel of the Lord and he uh, gets to the end of the wrestling match there and I often wonder about that, how, how he was able to do that. But nonetheless, Je God names him as a result. Genesis 32, 28. And he said to Jacob, Thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men, and hast prevailed. Israel means he will be a prince with God, but that wasn't what his parents named him. His parents named him holder of the heel or supplanter. Remember, on the way out, he grabbed his brother's heel. God redefined that because God had a purpose for him. God had a purpose for him. It means he will be a prince with God. 
Isn't it, as we're, as we're going, go ahead and turn to 1 Chronicles 22 for, as we get to the next one. Isn't it amazing how God redefines our purposes many times? You know, I don't know about you, but boy, if you'd looked at me at 16 years old, what purpose does he have? <laughs> so, man, you wouldn't have seen a whole lot. That kid just messing around his whole life. Is he going to do anything? But God had other ideas. God had other ideas. And by the way, same with you. God had other ideas for your life. If he had let you go your own way, just imagine what you would have turned out like. Just imagine what I would have turned out like. But God in his goodness had other purposes for us. In uh, 1 Chronicles 22, we're coming into the realm of Solomon. Solomon. Um, I, actually, this is something new that I learned. Solomon, actually, you could say, I don't, I don't know if anybody in Hebrew had a middle name, but he was given a second name. He was given both names by God. So the first name in 1 Chronicles 22, verse 8 to 9, But the word of the Lord came to me, that was David, saying, Behold, a son shall be born to thee who shall be a man of rest, and I will give him rest from all his enemies round about. For his name shall be Solomon, and I will give peace and quietness unto Israel in his days. David had been the warrior. David had been the mighty conqueror. Solomon, that, that's why, by the way, that's why David couldn't build the temple. God didn't want somebody building the temple that had been um, the cause of so much bloodshed, even though much of it was obedience to God. He was going to have his son Solomon do it. Solomon, God named Solomon, and he named him peace. Why? That was a purpose God had for him. He was going to be a king of peace. But it didn't end there. In 2 Samuel, remember Chronicles is like a summary of 1st, 2nd Samuel, 1st, 2nd Kings. So to the next part of the story, actually, let's go to 2 Samuel chapter 12. 2 Samuel chapter 12, okay, again, God naming um, Solomon, where this is before Solomon, 2 Samuel 12, 24, and David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in unto her, and lay with her, she bare a son, and he called his name Solomon, and the Lord loved him, and he, God, sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, this is how God spoke in those days, by the mouth of a prophet, and he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. Jedidiah, this is a great name, means beloved of Yahweh. God gave him a name signifying how much he loved him. How much he loved him. If you remember Solomon, a very u- unique individual, God comes to him in a dream, basically gives him any wish he wants. And what does he ask for? Really nothing for himself. He says, I want to lead your people correctly. Would you give me wisdom? And God says, oh yeah, I'll give you more wisdom than anybody that's ever lived or ever will live. And by the way, since you didn't ask for wealth and money and everything else, I'm going to give that to you as well. This was Solomon. No wonder God gave him these great names. God had a purpose for these people. Keep going. We're almost to the end of the ones that God named. God named. Go to John. So we're in the New Testament now. John 142. John 142. We come to the name Cephas, you probably know who that is. Uh, Petros, I think, is the Greek word for that, meaning a stone. Who is this? Peter. Peter. Did you know that? Jesus named Peter. Jesus named him. His name was Simon. John 142, and he brought him to Jesus. That was Simon. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas which is by interpretation a stone, a stone. Now, this is not proof that Peter was the first pope, okay? However, this is proof that God had a very unique purpose for Peter, very unique purpose. No wonder Peter stood in Acts chapter 2 in front of the multitude of lost people and thousands were saved, thousands. God had a very special purpose for Peter, and he shows it here in his name. Uh, Go to Luke 1.13. 113, we have the next one here. John. John, of course, we did this a few weeks ago. John the Baptist, we know him as. John, the Hebrew origin for this, uh, for this name is Jehovah is a gracious giver. And we see this here. It says in John 1, Luke, sorry, did I say John? Sorry, Luke 113. Luke 113, but the angel said unto him, John, sorry, Zacharias, fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and shall call his name John. God named all of these people 
Is it, uh, is it a mystery that his name means Jehovah is a gracious giver? What was Jehovah about ready to do? To put his son on the planet. John was to be his forerunner. God has a specific purpose. These, are all, these were all names given by the omniscient God who knew everything, past, present, and future. And what an interesting study that was, and it leads us to the best name that he ever gave. The reason for our message tonight, the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus, Matthew 121. Matthew 121. And she shall bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. I did make a slide for that. Jesus, the word there, Jesus, is Hebrew for Yeshua. Joshua, that is not mean. There, there are people out there that um, debate the deity of Jesus because they say Jesus doesn't even mean Jesus. They have all this crazy stuff that they're saying. It's, it actually means Joshua or Joshua. Yeah, that's all true. I don't, that's, it doesn't disprove anything. Uh, this is God's process. In Greek, in the New Testament, it's actually the word uh, Iesus. Okay, kind of actually sounds like Jesus. Iesus, in Greek, meaning Jehovah saves. Jehovah saves. Yahweh saves. He'll bring forth a son. He'll call his name Jesus. Christ was, uh, oddly enough, or not oddly enough, sorry. Uh, you may not realize this. I didn't, but Christ was added later on. It just means Messiah. Jesus Christ, Jesus the Messiah. And uh, it is a great name. God chose it. But his name, point number three, his name carries with it also a great meaning. A meaning, and it's more than just the definition of the word. I mean, most of us reading the scriptures wouldn't know that that was the definition of the word, right? Unless you're some sort of Hebrew or Greek uh, scholar of um, etymology, etc. You wouldn't know that. His name carries much more meaning than that. The name commonly given to a firstborn son was usually the name of the father. God didn't do that. He wasn't named Joseph. Um, God named him according to... His purpose, and we see that right there in Matthew 121 that we just read. He was given a God-given name that he would carry on this earth for 33 years with a God-given mission. This was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. His name is Jesus. It means Jehovah saves. God chose his name. God chose his mission. And God was talking about it way before he ever stepped on the planet. Way before. His name was foretold by the prophets. We're not going to spend too much time on this because we did a whole message on this. But the prophets were shown names for this one that would come. As a matter of fact, they weren't given the name Jesus. They were given a concept of a person that was going to come and deliver. You know, don't turn here, but Isaiah 7, 14, you all know this well. He says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive, bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, we know according to Matthew 1.23 on the screen for you taking notes, um, Emmanuel means God with us. God with us. They knew that back then. We don't know it unless it has been told to us again in the New Testament. We're thankful for that. God gave, if you notice in the New Testament, nobody ever calls Jesus Emmanuel. They call him Jesus. Words and um, names in the Old Testament were given to express a meaning. They were to express maybe a certain attribute or to give us insight into the person that they were talking about. And Isaiah does just that. And as I think of people in the New Testament, could be us, could be those 2,000 years ago when this is happening, they're reading these Old Testament passages. They don't have the benefit of the New Testament like we do to explain all of this. And they're looking at a verse here in Isaiah 9, or they're looking at another verse in Isaiah 7. Or, you know, as you're looking at, at, at prophecy, many times you're just seeing like the mountaintops. You're, you're seeing, uh, we're seeing in a linear fashion. That's, that's what we do because we live in time. We think it happens then and then and then and then. But when the scriptures talk about it, it's written by God, and he doesn't see things in a linear fashion necessarily. And here we are, prophets are trying to figure out who this person is, that the scriptures are talking about, names him Emmanuel, God with us, God coming down to this earth, God will be here. It's a person, but it'll be God. Talked about him way before he ever came. We see also a very familiar passage, don't turn there, Isaiah 9, 6. For unto us a child is born. We just talked about that, right? This was hundreds of years before it happened. Unto us a son is given. 
and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. He has six names? Five names? No, this is, these are meanings. These are attributes. These are explanations of who this person would be. He says his name's going to be Wonderful. Wonderful literally means a phenomenon that leaves you filled with wonder. Boy, apply that to Jesus. Amen. A phenomenon that leaves you filled with wonder. How many messages do we, uh, do we preach, do we study, do we talk about what happened when Jesus stepped foot on this planet? I mean, we're literally going to be in the Gospels for a long time talking about just what we know of what Jesus did. It fills you with wonder. His name would be Counselor. Counselor. Um, historically, this word gives the idea of a king giving counsel to his people. And boy, don't we see that with Jesus over and over and over again. I mean, he's 12 years old in the temple. We'll get to that in a few weeks. And he's counseling the men, the rabbis, the religious leaders, the people that everybody respected. This 12-year-old kid is counseling them. That's our counselor. He was talking about him way before he ever came. Way before. He calls him in here, the mighty God. Not the mighty man, but the mighty God who came. He's going to be a son. He's going to come. He's the mighty God. The Hebrew word for mighty God is El Gabor. El meaning God, and Gabor meaning strength. God of strength. I mean, Paul even speaks about Jesus in this manner in, in such a well-known passage, Philippians 4, 13. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. He's our God of strength, our God of might in the man, Jesus. Oh, the name means a lot. The name means a lot. He says in, uh, in John 8, 58, don't, don't turn there, everlasting Father. That's establishing Jesus' eternal nature, everlasting Father, and also at the same time his oneness with God the Father. By the way, this was one of the main reasons he was crucified, because he claimed to be God. He claimed to be deity. And everybody knew that, that encountered him. Lastly, the Prince of Peace. This is a Hebrew word for shar shalom. We've heard that word shalom, meaning peace. This is the one who removes all peace-disturbing factors. Now, Jesus was a very unlikely kingly ruler. Uh, the, according to the prophecies, most of the prophets that we read about, they thought he was going to come and take over the government. They thought he was going to bring back the glory to Israel. And he was honestly quite a disappointment to many of them in that respect. They were under the oppression of Rome. And he wanted th they wanted him to come and overrule what they had been under. Instead, he came to bring them peace with God. <laughs> That's what he came to bring. He came to deliver them from their sins, and we see that in Colossians 1. So I'd like us to consider tonight that maybe the name Jesus is not necessarily what's so special about it. I mean, we're not Hebrews. But what's so special is the significance of the one who wore that name. The significance of the being that came down, wrapped himself in flesh, and lived on this earth for 33 years. In conclusion, Bill Crowder says this. I, I thought this was excellent. He writes this about what Jesus' name means to us. Number one, it is the name by which we must be saved. It's the name God chose because it represents a person, a person that walked this earth sinless and pure and holy and righteous and sacrificed, laid down willingly his life for you and I, don't turn there, Acts 4.12, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Because Jesus was a person. It's not a magic name. It is a name of someone who is much better than anything magical that's ever happened. It was Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Secondly, about what Jesus' name means to us, it is a name that sets the tone for everything we do. Think about that. He, matter of fact, Paul says in Colossians 3, 17, And whatsoever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. What was he saying? Everything you do, Jesus ought to be able to approve of that. Everything. He says, number three, It is the name at which one day in the future every knee will bow. Every knee will bow. 
It's not necessarily because they're bowing at the name. They're bowing at the one who was named Jesus. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. You know, this name, as we're closing up here, this, this name means brings much dedication from his followers. You know, we don't, we don't just follow um, a famous person. We, f- we follow someone who set an example that is unequaled. We follow a good and gracious creator who humbled himself, took on the form of a servant, and came down in the likeness of men, humbled himself, was obedient unto death for you and for I. That's what makes the name of Jesus so great. God chose it. God chose who was going to bring the one named Jesus into this world. God chose the name. God chose his meaning. God chose his mission. God chose everything about what was going to happen. He had a purpose in it. And yes, it was for the glory of God, but it was for my good and for your good. Aren't you glad that the glory of God includes your good in it? (laughs) I mean, aren't you glad? I mean, think of all the false gods down through history, those in Greek mythology. Oh yeah, it was all about their glory, but it wasn't for the good of the people. It was just all about their glory. That's, I mean, mankind down through history has worshipped people like that. Not our God. Thank God for Jesus Christ. Thank God for the name that he gave his son. Thank God that we're going to spend, I mean, literally months studying the life of his son, and we're just going to scratch the surface of somebody like this. No ordinary man. No ordinary name. Let's bow in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for your name tonight. Lord, it's so much more than just something to put in a song. It's so much more than just to uh, something to have affection for. It is deeply connected with your purpose, is deeply connected with who you are, deeply connected with your grace given to sinners, of which I am chief. I will echo the Apostle Paul, Lord. I'm so undeserving. Father, bring an attitude of humility to myself, to each of us, Lord, as we realize your great name. Lord, who it represents, the purpose you had in the life of Jesus Christ. Father, we love you tonight. I pray that each of us would just have a time of praise tonight and thanksgiving for Jesus. Lord, it would motivate us this week to be what we ought to be because we wear your name to lay down our lives because no matter what we lay down, we will never equal what you laid down. Father, to trust you, to run into your name. Your word tells us your name is a strong tower. The righteous runneth into it and are safe. We have nothing to fear. We have nothing to fear. Lord, we love you tonight. We praise your name. Help us as we attempt to thank you for who you are and what you've done. In your name I ask, amen. Would you stand with me tonight?